Okay. So we've just gone three o'clock. Um, so I would like to welcome everybody back again this week to the, the next uh, talk in the series that's uh, uh, organized jointly between ICDP and the University of Trento, so of environmental meteorology. And this week it's ICTP that's hosting the talk. And so I have had the great pleasure of introducing Professor Anna Creti. Um, she obtained her PhD in economics at the Toulouse School of Economics. And then she was a postdoctorate researcher at the London School of Economics. Um, and she actually at one point came back to Italy for a little while. <laughs> I remember Anna telling me at one point that she also returned to Italy for a short period of time, was a researcher here. But then she moved to uh, Paris again, and because I think you were in Paris before you came to Italy, if I remember when we met. So Anna and I actually know each other through, uh, we were both on the scientific uh, um, board, advisory board of WASCO uh, project in West Africa. We were just catching up on that now for a number of years together. And now uh, Professor Anna Caretti is a Professor of Economics at Paris Dauphine University. She's also the Scientific Director of the Climate Economics Chair, and she is the Scientific Director of the Natural Gas Economics Chair. And she is going to be presenting to us today a talk about wind farm revenues in Western Europe in the present and future climates. Uh, Anna, I will pass the floor to you. And thank you very much for joining us and uh, taking the time for this presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian. It's a pleasure to be uh, with you um, in my own country, even if at distance. Um, and thank you for the introduction. As you may have understood, my um, research interest uh, lies in the um, economics of the energy and climate transition. And uh, one of the natural way to uh, um, look at this problem is to uh, um, in particular, uh, study the role of uh, renewables. Um, so um, uh, I'm an economist, of course, uh, but this work that I'm presenting today um, is the result of a joint work. Uh, so the names uh, would have been long uh, to, to be uh, here in the slide, but you had it in, uh, in the abstract. Um, so it's a joint work uh, between uh, uh, economists and um, uh, climatologists, meteorologists. Um, so, and uh, we have in the team two meteorologists and three economists. So the twist that I'm presenting today is of course uh, more related to the economic question. Um, so I beg your pardon in advance if there is something on, uh, on the climate side uh, and the sense of the scientific part of the climate side that is not uh, clear enough, I'll try to, uh, to explain that in my own words and in my own understanding. Uh, it's a team and actually Adrian knows also one of my co-authors and perhaps you, you know it as well, uh, Philippe Dobrinsky. Um, we have a cooperation since a few years and we have studied different, under different angles uh, the question of uh, renewables, starting with a study that we have published uh, um, and it was focused in Italy. Um, the project and the, and the paper I'm presenting today uh, is specific on uh, uh, windmills um, in, uh, in Western Europe. Um, and if I can just uh, introduce um, very briefly the question we are going to ask um, and try to also give some answers um, is that um, the, the, the importance of renewables and in particular of windmills uh, is one of the pillar of the uh, decarbonization of the uh, energy industry. Um, and uh, actually, as you can read in this slide, um, when we think about intermittent renewables, uh, wind has a very clear interest um, and uh, we see that the, uh, in terms of capacity uh, there was uh, even an increase even last year despite the uh, COVID crisis because of course these investments were 
planned in advance and they happen to occur. Um, so worldwide, we have an installed capacity that is uh, important, uh, 65 gigawatt, even if, uh, of course, it is not displacing uh, uh, coal or gas or not as much as we would like to. Um, still with additions that are, uh, I mean, regular and continuous, it's a quite dynamic sector. Um, the one of the reasons why we also find these uh, uh, capacity additions is that it's a sector, as many as it is the case for many renewables, that is subsidized uh, under different forms. Um, we can have something that I'm going to discuss later on, that is uh, feeding tariffs. Uh, those are fixed terms contract uh, that span over from 10 to 20 years, depending on the countries. And uh, they rely on, on um, fixed uh, revenue that is granted uh, to the production of electricity. So notice the difference that, uh, of course, this is uh, one thing is the capacity that is installed and given that they are intermittent, another one is the production, but feeding tariffs are really related to the production of, uh, of uh, renewables. Um, uh, or there are also other forms uh, that uh, may be found, for instance, in the United States uh, with a specific uh, uh, power purchase agreement, public and private. Uh, but in any case, uh, some uh, protection, I would say, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, recovering the cost that remains quite important uh, when installing uh, uh, windmill capacity. Um, here you can see just a, a snapshot of the relative importance of wind uh, and how it has evolved uh, in the last years, uh, accounting for um, a small but substantial part of renewable energy. Um, which is the question? Um, uh, there is, of course, this subsidy, uh, which is for the moment granting the uh, sustainability, the financial sustainability of these investments, uh, but uh, there are some problems or some uncertainties uh, when investing in, uh, in windmills. One is that due to the increasing penetration of renewables into the electricity mix, um, what we can observe is that uh, the uh, price, uh, the electricity price decreases. Uh, feeding tariffs are something that is not going to last forever. And therefore, when you plan today uh, your investment for the next uh, uh, 20 to 50 years, um, at some point you know that uh, this kind of fixed remuneration is going to, to stop. Um, so this is the first problem. This is the idea of uh, are they um, still profitable? And they will be profitable in the future. The second question is that uh, how much they can produce. Um, and this is related to the second source of uncertainty, which is the uncertainty linked to uh, the availability of the natural resource, um, uh, that is wind. And now in that, uh, of course, the sites that are the, um, the most profitable ones um, become more and more uh, scarce. Um, therefore, there is an important uh, impact uh, that will that is given from the um, due to the uh, variability of wind. Um, so this is really the question that we uh, we issues that we take in in uh, in this paper, and we look at the long term profitability of windmills, um, taking into account. Uh, uh, those two sources of uncertainties. On one side, the economic uncertainty, and the other side, the uh, variability of the natural resource. Um, not to uh, be very long on the, on the literature, uh, the, um, why this paper is, uh, is interesting. Just to say that, uh, of course, there is a bunch of paper on uh, uh, the uh, dynamics of wind power cost, uh, 
during the last 20 years, we have witnessed a decrease of this, this cost due to different form of learning effects um, in wind, like also in, uh, in the uh, uh, photovoltaics industry. On another side, we have uh, uh, papers on climate data uh, that I've already uh, tried to uh, put some uh, uh, methodologies, uh, even a little bit, I would say, plug and play for the investors uh, in order to evaluate the wind potential in the future. Um, but uh, we find um, a few papers, if not to say um, uh, very few papers, uh, that um, take the same um, perspective of understanding on one side the profitability of wind, uh, on the other side, the uh, variability of the resource, um, not only as private operators, but also on the public side. Uh, so one of the um, interest points that we are going to discuss is also the cost or the simulation uh, of public support measures needed to make uh, wind energy profitable. And of course, in the long term, this also means uh, to understand uh, the, uh, the role of the public intervention that is going to help or that is needed also to, uh, to meet the objectives of uh, uh, integration of renewables into the electricity mix. Um, of course, there is a target uh, under the uh, latest European directives. Um, so we have uh, uh, targets in terms of uh, percentage of renewable energy in final consumption. And we know that to attain these targets, uh, actually 27%, uh, the investment in uh, wind farm and solar farms has to progress. So the question is, is really uh, also on the agenda of the, uh, not only the energy transition, but even more recently of the different forms of green investment or the green deal. Um, so um, uh, in a nutshell, what we do, uh, we try to quantify the uncertainty uh, in particular in a very simple indicator of profitability, the net present value uh, of uh, standardized wind farm in uh, different European countries. Um, and we evaluate also the level and the total cost of the uh, subsidies uh, needed to guarantee the profitability of uh, the representative uh, wind fleet that we are going to model. Um, what it is the uh, specificity in terms of, of methodology? Um, the previous papers have treated separately either the economic questions of profitability or the uh, focusing on the cost decrease, not really on the revenues, um, and, and other papers that have uh, um, uh, studied the uh, climate question. So what we do is that we have a common framework um, to, to do so, um, which means that we have the same methodology or the the same methodology, at least um, the same uh, guidelines uh, to build a common methodology on one side to understand the drivers of the actual, what we call, and I will be more explicit later on, the present economic and climate conditions. And then we do some scenarios, some projections uh, for the future. But um, this is done in a very, um, as from the beginning, uh, in, uh, in, I would say, two pillars of the same model based on uh, the uh, criteria that can really uh, interconnect uh, the economic side and the uh, climatic side. So just to give a few details, uh, um, we build a localized model. So the definition uh, is very precise. Uh, the, uh, territorial level for wind power output in uh, different countries. And we um, make this coupling uh, with uh, some characteristics of the electricity sector, in particular, the uh, uh, consideration and the uh, calculation of the 
present and future electricity demand. Uh, we also simulate um, electricity pricing, um, taking into account uh, some structural characteristics uh, such as, in particular, the variation of wind, uh, the characteristics of the loads, and the way in which price are formed in this sector. Um, this is where we had uh, the cooperation uh, with uh, our uh, team, uh, the meteor meteorologists and the climatologists, something that I've learned uh, during this experience is to use this famous reanalysis data. Um, it took me a while to understand uh, this also this kind of uh, terminology uh, and what does it mean to you. I'm sure that is uh, perhaps one of the uh, clearest issues of question of, of the of the paper. Um, we also use cl climate projections and uh, taken from integrated as assessment models to build scenarios and to make also some robustness. Um, well, I'm not, uh, as an economist, um, when we know that when we build scenarios, uh, there we, the exercise is interesting on one side, but uh, we may miss a lot of questions or a lot of factors that can modify them. Um, so therefore, we are trying to, to, to make scenarios that are not very long-term, uh, but they are, um, I would say, long enough in order to understand the uh, profitability. So if they are over the lifetime cycle of uh, wind farms. Um, uh, the methodology that we use uh, could be replicated. Uh, it is general enough, uh, but we had data for France, Germany and Denmark. Um, this is interesting because the electricity mix uh, which of course we take as a starting point for these uh, three countries uh, is quite different. Uh, France is dominated by, as you know, nuclear power. Uh, Germany is embracing uh, a very strong uh, uh, energy transition, um, having stopped uh, nuclear and uh, having invested uh, uh, quite int intensively uh, actually in, already in, uh, in uh, wind power. Uh, in Denmark, uh, that uh, displays the most decarbonized uh, mix. Um, Denmark really um, has, a, has a mix that is almost 60% uh, based on, uh, on wind, I mean, today already. Uh, and uh, since they are integrated in the, in the northern market, they also use a, a, a lot of um, hydroelectric electricity. So we have also in terms of uh, um, the impact of penetration of renewables in the future, uh, the uh, impact also on uh, the relative impact on prices, uh, I mean, electricity prices will be different. And this is something that uh, is endogenous that is we take into account in our model. Um, the uh, other question that uh, is really an economic one is the cost of uh, uh, the support mechanism. Um, we quantify them precisely in order to understand uh, their impact on different scenarios that we build uh, in order to make wind energy profitable. Um, overall, uh, we can describe uh, um, uh, the entire uh, interval of uh, the total cost, depending on the different countries, which varies in the different countries. And uh, um, just as a teaser, there will be one country which uh, has the lowest cost in terms of uh, public intervention. Uh, so we are going to unveil uh, the cost of the energy transition, even if uh, this is one of possible quantification I don't know if I can quantify, I can say that it is an underestimation or an overestimation. We try to cover different scenarios. Um, but still, it is interesting to see um, how much it is going to cost to decarbonize uh, the electricity sector. Even in France, I mean, where uh, the, uh, uh, it is something that we, uh, we hear quite 
frequently here in France that saying that since the nuclear power is decarbonized, why should we bother for uh, integrating wind? Um, this is something that we show it is possible uh, and we show whether the profitability in France uh, differs uh, depending on compared to other countries. Anyway, um, suffer, so the, these kind of subsidies, uh, both today and in the future, uh, seem to be you know, still important to guarantee the profitability of wind farms. Um, so in terms of uh, being now um, more uh, um, precise on uh, uh, the characteristics of the model, um, so the model is going to, uh, mm, I mean, the main interest is to uh, have this idea of uh, generating uh, electricity prices and uh, production from uh, uh, windmills today and in the future. So um, little by little, what we mean by today and the future will be clarified. And Adrian, interrupt me, please, if there are some questions in the meantime, in particular, Mm, clarification questions uh, if the, there are aspects that are not clear or not uh, uh, sufficiently explained uh, in, in my presentation. Um, so uh, we, uh, this is the, uh, the main input for the model in order to analyze the uh, variability of wind farm revenues and uh, also uh, the, uh, the difference under the, the, uh, the scenarios today and in the future. Um, those scenarios uh, are the uh, <clears throat> one of the, I would say, the most important outputs uh, of the model. Uh, we have uh, uh, different scenarios with different assumptions in terms of uh, not only the economic variability, but also the climate variability. And here also we see the sensitivity of the scenarios uh, by uh, um, I would say uh, correcting in different ways for the climate variability. Uh, and this um, in turn uh, will have an impact also on the cost of public subsidies. Um, more details on the simulations. Um, so uh, we um, doing this exercise uh, of building uh, future price scenarios uh, is always um, an approximation, right? So we had to start, we wanted to start from some uh, uh, well-known methodologies. So we, uh, we use electricity demand in uh, renewable penetration scenario projections from uh, integrated assessment models. Um, so uh, then it is something, so the, the, from existing, I should say, integrated assessment models. Uh, that are used in uh, these three different countries in order also to simulate uh, um, future scenarios by the uh, uh, energy agencies or the uh, uh, system operators. Um, the, um, one of the main point is to make these uh, scenarios compatible uh, with the scenarios that are used on the climate dimension. Uh, so we combine them with uh, uh, data on the wind speed and temperature projections from uh, uh, what you know uh, more than me again, uh, the regional climate model intercomparison, that is the CORDEX data, uh, and uh, Filippo is uh, one of the leaders in the, uh, uh, in the uh, production of this, uh, this data, uh, and this corresponds to uh, several uh, representative concentration pathways, uh, RCP. And uh, in particular, uh, the, uh, as of when, when I was saying that the models are quite sensitive to some uh, corrections that we can make um, on the climate dimension, uh, what we see is that um, using or not uh, uh, this uh, RCP is going also to have an, an impact uh, quite strong in terms of uh, uh, the um, uh, assessment of the uh, profitability of windmills. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, the paper is actually uh, uh, submitted to an economic journal. Uh, and that is why perhaps the message uh, that I'm going to, uh, to, to deliver 
um, have a specifically an economic flavor, uh, in particular, uh, the objective of the uh, of this construction is uh, to uh, to really have uh, uh, an idea of the um, uh, this loop between the inter the uh, penetration the of the renewables, the impact that they can have on electricity prices, and therefore on the uh, net present value, uh, which is an indicator, the very, um, the simplest one of the profitability uh, of uh, windmills. Um, uh, what we do, uh, and I'm going to uh, first uh, explain it and then give you um, uh, a figure, so which is uh, a nice, uh, um, I would say a snapshot of uh, what, uh, how this can be represented. Uh, so basically the methodology encompasses three steps. Um, uh, knowing that, uh, as I was saying, um, hopefully in a clear way from the beginning, we have these two pillars. One the, is the economic and the other is the climatic one. Uh, and we try to, uh, to, to have uh, common methodologies in order to come up uh, with uh, the economic scenarios. So in uh, the first step is, uh, I would say, uh, like the basis uh, in order to also make those the, the two parts of the model to communicate. Um, so we reduce the bias of the long term, uh, long time series of uh, wind speed uh, measured at the surface and the temperature uh, from the uh, ERA 20 series analysis. Um, that uh, have a different resolution uh, of the ERA-5 reanalysis. So uh, this has been uh, uh, mainly the correction that has mm, been introduced uh, and that was uh, quite um, interesting, I would say, uh, uh, seen from, uh, from my perspective, uh, because I mean, these two database or these two reanalysis are quite different. So we had to, um, to have this common denominator and uh, one of the uh, uh, statistical analysis that we do uh, is to perform a, a quantile quantile correction in order to also minimize the variability. Uh, in the uh, second step, um, we uh, start introducing uh, the uh, the question of the economic questions. Um, so. Uh, in order to, uh, uh, to come up with uh, uh, um, the, the price model and therefore the long time series of electricity prices, um, we have uh, uh, two compounded uh, um, tasks. Uh, one is to generate long time series of national production demand, um, calibrating uh, the model on the past of the uh, electricity prices in these three, three countries. Um, and on the other side, we also uh, downscale uh, the uh, wind speed time series to match uh, with uh, the um, uh, time horizon at which the electricity prices are uh, um, set, are calculated, that is an hourly uh, frequency. Uh, so we take in particular from the economic side, uh, uh, the uh, day ahead uh, prices, uh, which are, um, I would say, one indicator, there are many electricity prices that can be considered, uh, but uh, they are, I would be uh, the most transparent ones, and the, also the, um, the, uh, the ones on which we can find uh, uh, more uh, reliable data and also the uh, most liquid markets. Um, so we try to, uh, that is why I was saying, we try to, to, to combine uh, in a coherent way uh, uh, the, uh, the data on climate that of course has a frequency that is uh, uh, much more precise than the hourly horizon, but this was also a compromise uh, to have a common pass or a common time scale uh, with the uh, electricity pricing. Uh, and uh, finally, we uh, combine them uh, in uh, considering uh, um, um, production function uh, to um, get electricity. Uh, and this is going to give us the time series 
of local uh, wind power production, um, which is going then to generate our prices, uh, taking into account an equilibrium analysis uh, that is uh, uh, given the characteristic of the demand, the, that is also called the load, and the uh, characteristics of the supply, uh, we make therefore um, uh, the uh, equilibrium uh, at each hour. Um, so the, uh, this is, uh, I would say, um, the summary uh, of uh, uh, the two pillars of the model. Uh, on, on the uh, right in panel B, uh, we see some uh, uh, details on the uh, electricity price uh, um, I mentioned. Uh, on the uh, on the other side, we have in the in the panel A uh, the uh, um, climatic uh, part, and uh, not well. well uh, the, I have to say that behind the model, there's an intense uh, treatment of data and combination of data that has taken a lot of time. And uh, the, this has been done by actually uh, Bastien, who is uh, working at Meteo France. Uh, and as you can see from the uh, from panel B, um, what we uh, well when we do introduce economics, uh, it seems that uh, the the question is a little bit more complex. Uh, but we made also our life a little bit more complex because we wanted to have this really equilibrium perspective. Uh, that is, we didn't just take uh, uh, the uh, um, calibration of the model as many papers do uh, in the sense that they take the, uh, the past data uh, as we are used to do in economics, we calibrate the models and we do projections. Uh, we wanted to keep the model very rich uh, and uh, to have this equilibrium between uh, demand and supply. Um, and at each step of um, modeling uh, production on one side and demand on the other, uh, we uh, correct for the uh, important um, fundamentals. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the climate um, input, uh, in particular for the production wind speed and for the demand, the surface temperature. Uh, those are some of the fundamentals, but the ones we are interested in. Um, and so we see that here we mix up uh, climatic data with the uh, demand and the production data that comes from NSOE, who is the, uh, um, is the um, European body for the uh, regulation of networks, uh, of electricity networks, and they have a common framework to, um, uh, to publish uh, data in different European countries. Um, so the, um, the also the time horizon have been uh, uh, quite a challenge uh because i mean the the time span uh, available for the uh, climate data is much longer than what we have for the um, uh, electricity uh, production and electricity demand uh, therefore we had also to take into account uh, these differences uh, by uh, therefore simulating the data that we're missing Again, interrupt me if I can specify more, uh, given also our time constraints. So now it is time to define what we call uh, <laughs> present and future. Uh, very evocative terms to, uh, and at the end of the day, we, we have really um, quite convergent idea on what it is uh, the, the, the present climate. Um, they respond, in fact, to the, the, the idea of having this distinction um, uh, comes uh, not in terms of making a, uh, or having heterogeneous methodologies, it's just the focus that is slightly different. Uh, what we call the uh, present climate data set, uh, it is actually used to study the uh, variability uh, of the wind revenues um, 
at the actual uh, climate conditions, uh, referring to the ones that we can observe. Um, and we take also something on the economic side as a constant, as given, um, that is the uh, current market arrangement and the, uh, in particular, the electricity mix. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, wind power production, uh, as I would say, the resolution is quite uh, uh, precise. Uh, we look at their head prices, and uh, here we then introduce the differences between France, Germany, and Denmark. Um, France and Germany, um, in fact, uh, they belong to uh, a set, um, similar um, price zone. Uh, but still, uh, the uh, the day ahead prices are different, uh, and, and this was interesting to us because uh, uh, there is this link between the, uh, of course, the electricity prices and the existing electricity mix. Um, therefore, the, this part. So, 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 what it is the present climate is the data from uh, uh, the beginning of the uh, um, 19th to the 20th century up to 2010. Um, which are therefore some uh, results that they can show. Um, so um, still we have long time trends. Well, long time, if I have to adopt uh, an economic vision, uh, that is, uh, uh, they are here displayed in a 10 year sliding mean. Of course, we have also data more detailed, but I wanted just to, uh, to see the, uh, uh, long trends because they are easier perhaps to compare and to understand. Uh, so we ha have here the, the, the three countries, uh, uh, France, Germany, and Denmark. Um, and what we have is in, uh, in green, the uh, electricity price uh, and uh, the uh, national consumption in red and the, uh, um, the um, penetration of, of wind. Um, so what we can see is that, of course, there are some evident correlations. There are some patterns that are common to the to the three countries. Um, this is also one of the results of the current market uh, design in uh, uh, in the electricity sector, in which um, the the prices that we look at the day ahead prices are done through a transparent market mechanism. Um, and therefore, they are, I would say, uh, quite uh, neutral in the sense that they reflect some uh, uh, characteristics of the uh, production and, uh, or, and consumption, um, typically the importance of the temperature and the economic activity. Um, nevertheless, as you can see, also we have uh, uh, some divergences, uh, in particular, you can see the level that we have represented, the, the scale is a little bit different, uh, with uh, uh, Denmark having the lowest prices. Um, this is the uh, combined result on one side of the uh, size of the demand, on one part uh, side of the, 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 the country that is a uh, lower population and therefore a lower demand, but also the fact that they use, as I was saying, a, a mix that is already relying on uh, uh, a lot of wind uh, and uh, hydroelectric, uh, which have a very low variable cost, well, zero for the, uh, for the wind, uh, windmills and very low variable cost for the uh, uh, hydroelectric power. And as soon as you uh, integrate in this mix uh, fossil uh, fuel and thermal generation, uh, we have that the price increase. Uh, Germany is um, somehow in the middle uh, in the sense that they use uh, over the period that we observe also a lot of coal, which is far from being decarbonized, but it is not very costly. Uh, and then we have France, uh, where the, um, on average, I would say that the electricity price really reflects the long-term cost of the most important uh, technology that is uh, uh, nuclear. So it, it, it tends to be, uh, it tends to be aligned 
to the long-term cost, uh, variable cost of nuclear power. Uh, what it is then the uh, future and or the long term? Um, so what we describe as the future is our exercise of uh, simulation of uh, scenarios. Um, and uh, it is uh, perhaps conservative in the sense that we do not, as I was anticipating, uh, our scenarios are not very, very long term. Um, these allow us perhaps to uh, minimize the, uh, the, uh, the errors, the uh, mistakes, the, uh, um, the, the problem of precision of, of, of the uh, assessments uh, of these data. And on the other side, uh, they are coherent with the fact that uh, we, in the simulation, what it is important to us is to see the uh, um, uh, productive life of a typical uh, wind farm. Uh, so those are uh, facilities that depending on the technology, but we use a standardized technology uh, can last up to 30 or 40 years. So we took the maximum that is 2050 uh, and therefore the future is for us bounded at 2050. Um, they, we uh, use uh, therefore the future climate data set to study in particular the variability of the wind farm revenues and their value under uh, uh, different characteristics of the future that is different level of uh, demand wind energy penetration, and of course, uh, the evolution of the uh, uh, climate. Uh, here, what we use uh, is a spatial resolution that changes a little bit in order to have uh, more precision in the, in the long term. Uh, and therefore, they correspond to projected scenarios under the RCP 4.5 and 8.5. Uh, and we use five different regional climate models. Um, this is from the climate, and then uh, um, try to, 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 to speed up a little bit um, to, to give just uh, the important information on the different scenarios for future electricity demand. Here we use this uh, image scenario that is an impact assessment model quite commonly um, used for projections uh, in, uh, for instance, at the uh, uh, energy, uh, International Energy Agency. Um, and the, uh, when we say electrification, it means that uh, there are some assumptions on which final usages are going to, uh, to shift towards uh, electrification, for instance, transport. So this is the, what we refer to as a medium, low and high electrification. Um, two scenarios for wind energy penetration that is again, low and high. So we have in total six economic scenarios that are completed at every uh, time uh, with the uh, climate scenarios. Um, so uh, I'm just going here to, to, to give some uh, uh, precision or some uh, further data on, uh, on the uh, wind penetration uh, on one side and the uh, level of electrification of the further electrification. It has to be understood in terms of grow rates. So when we say zero, it means that there is no uh, increase of the demand uh, and, uh, and therefore so on and so forth for the medium and the high increase of the demand. Uh, and therefore we have also those uh, different scenarios. Um, and you see that another thing that is interesting in the model for get to, to we we'll to see the to be specific before is that we also make the distinction very important between onshore and offshore wind. Um, so the the of course their productivity is very different. Their costs also are different, and therefore the uh, profitability uh, will be different, and in turn also the subsidies will be different. Um, so the, um, uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, what we have is uh, 60 different price projections for each country. Uh, they come from uh, the combination of the RCP uh, the models, the demand scenarios and the penetration scenarios and for each of the uh, six economic scenarios. Um, just to again give a, um, a synthesis of the model, uh, 
uh, this is one of the outputs that we, we can uh, um, obtain. Uh, so you see the, the point at which uh, we start uh, making our uh, simulations. So we have the yearly average price projections for the uh, six economic scenarios. So what we have in the left is the low penetration for uh, uh, the three countries, uh, France, Germany, and Denmark in the different colors, blue, black, and, and, and red. And again, we, you see that this idea of the common trends, but with different uh, levels and also different variability, um, they also depend on the uh, penetration uh, of wind on, on the other side and the extent of the electrification that is uh, specified in the uh, no trend, 0% increase of demand, 28% and 43% respectively, if I consider therefore the different rows. Um, there is, um, as you can see, uh, also problem in uh, 2020, which is, I mean, a technical problem of the, of the data. Um, so, in uh, um, which are the determinants of the wind farm revenues? Of course, uh, we we have we also have extreme variation of the net present value um, the uh, over the uh, long term, uh, and in particular, we can calculate that the uh, variation of the net present value uh, that is the discounted sum of the revenues that uh, the windmills can get given their production uh, that is of course affected by the uh, uh, wind speed and the climate uh, variability, um, including the subsidies. So the order of the variation is one year of revenues um, and uh, the, these, the variation can also depend on whether we use or not, and which is the level also of the subsidies that we consider. Uh, we consider different form of subsidies because both of them are actually being used and the countries sometimes switch from one to the other. Um, this is a problem of consistency of the support that we do not take also for us. It is uh, like uh, um, simulating two different way of uh, supporting uh, windmills. One is the feed-in tariffs that I have already explained, and the other is the feed-in premium that is a nap lift on the electricity price. And we take the average uh, values that have been used in the three countries for feed-in tariffs on one side and for feed-in premium, uh, this latter being used actually in Denmark, whereas uh, in uh, uh, in France, we are still with feeding tariffs, and uh, in Germany, um, there was a shift uh, on uh, premium very recently. Um, when projecting the, the future value of the wind farm based on historical production record, then we take the point of view of an investor. Um, and what we show, which is quite interesting, uh, is that uh, in the paper that I have mentioned at the beginning, that um, uh, want to uh, somehow measure the variability of the net present value of um, just the uh, representative windmills, even considering uh, the future variation of wind speed, we see that clearly the uh, precision of this kind of approach is very poor. And that compared to what we do, that is uh, having a consistent and a combined economic on one side and climatic model on the other, we see that uh, the, it is possible that the, the, the first approach is, of course, simpler, as I was saying, plug and play, but it may misconduct or may uh, give uh, values that can be, in particular, overestimated or underestimated. It depends on the location of the, of the project, and therefore they are not very reliable or they do not give the, 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 uh, the right information to private investors. So uh, a few details uh, on uh, on the uh, simulation. So uh, we have this data set spanning on uh, 111 years. We define uh, 81 virtual wind farm producer for the production points. Um, so this is due to the uh, um, Y81. It depends on the uh, definition, the territorial definition of, of, of the data is the grid point. Uh, that we have used, the, the ones the same as that are used in, uh, in, the, um, in the climate data. 
And uh, therefore, as I was saying, we have 30 years. I see you appearing, Adrian. Either there are questions or I'm approaching the end. <laughs> uh, what do you say? Uh, no, carry on. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt okay. you. Uh, it's just okay. uh, no questions yet. We'll, we'll come to those at the end. Well, later. Okay. Yeah. Um, so at the end of the day, we, we have finally the calculation of the net present value. Um, and uh, since uh, there is a lot of uh, variation, both in the price and in the wind speed and the climate, of course, we also take into account uh, the um, one of the measure of the risk uh, that is commonly used by investors, that is the value at risk at the 95% uh, quantity. Um, so what we have, we, we can see the, uh, um, again, in a figure that is going to come just uh, afterwards, uh, the, um, the uh, mean and the difference between uh, the mean of, of the value at risk uh, over all our uh, project on uh, 30 years. And we compare them uh, uh, whether they are running with a subsidy under form of feeding tariffs, under form of uh, feeding premium. And we, um, in this map, uh, the red contour, the red line is the project that have a um, net present value equal to zero. Uh, so um, in fact, the one that are, we, we should have perhaps invested the, the color line, uh, because the, the ones that are, they are in uh, blue, that appear in blue, they are in fact um, not, uh, so they are displaying a negative. Uh, net present value. So, and so what, what we can see is that depending on the level of the subsidies, which is on, on the right, we can make those, pro those uh, projects uh, viable. Um, in particular, the uh, profitability uh, has to be sustained for offshore wind farms, because as I was saying, they are much more costly. Um, and they, um, for, well, for instance, in France, we have, uh, there is a very limited offshore capacity, so everything is has to come. Uh, in Germany, uh, there, is, um, there is already uh, an important installed capacity as well as in, uh, in Denmark. Therefore, the additions that we could also um, consider are very different. Uh, for onshore wind farms, um, the profitability is still in France. Uh, but because France, again, is at the beginning, therefore what we simulate is perhaps some, the exploitation of some sites that uh, can be still quite profitable, whereas the ones that are profitable in Germany and in Denmark have already been taken. Um, in uh, this is regarding the spatial variability. In terms of uh, the uh, time horizon variability, the NPV doesn't vary so much in the long term. Uh, the standard deviation is below 5%. But as I was saying, uh, again, uh, we see the sensitivity of these values to the representation of the, uh, um, the climate. In particular, uh, we have done some exercises by removing the trends on the ERA 20C wind speed, and this has a large impact on the variability of the, um, in particular, on the interquantile range of, uh, of the uh, of the project. Uh, and if we make the, this correction, um, the uh, um, I would say that the economic viability uh, seems to be. Um, really uh, 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 questionable uh, and uh, they decrease basically the profitability uh, all along the time that we consider. Um, we also make for the future, therefore we, we make another kind of uh, simulation. Uh, what we do is that uh, we make an exercise that in uh, economics is uh, especially for the uh, um, forecast of uh, the penetration of renewables, uh, it is quite uh, common. That is, uh, we start, we take the actual um, capacity and we decommission it. Uh, therefore, we is like building again everything, um, and uh, we start in 2021. So, 
uh, we have a new wave of, uh, of projects. Uh, we uh, display the uh, net present value over the 10 cortex simulations and for each of the scenarios uh, and for the different hypotheses of electrification. Uh, just to give some, um, some data, um, uh, the NPV is low uh, and without, again, uh, subsidies. Uh, it is positive in France, but I mean, one uh, uh, in, depending on well, if still given the cost of this installation, one million of euros per megawatt uh, is positive, but not extremely high. So again, uh, there is room for uh, subsidies. Uh, again, this is the uh, you can see the projection on the on the future. The map is dominated by the blue uh, uh, colors. Again, the low or negative profitability with some uh, slots uh, in the red areas that are profitable, depending also on the level of penetration. Uh, last point, uh, the, um, as I was promising from the beginning, the quantification of the support level that would be needed to guarantee the profitability of, of the wind fleet. Uh, so basically, we, um, we simulate uh, the level of feeding tariffs or feeding premia, depending on the different scenarios, uh, that will uh, uh, make the net present value at least equal to zero. So, um, which are the, uh, the, um, the uh, evaluation that we come up with? Um, we have um, an interval given that we have simulation and different scenarios. Um, and here, the, 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 the teasing I was uh, announcing uh, is now disclosed. Uh, if you are an investor, uh, you are more secure. Uh, in Denmark, in the sense that uh, the premium for onshore and uh, uh, offshore, sorry, sorry, in between the brackets, for in Denmark is, uh, is very low, meaning that at market prices, they are almost, almost uh, viable. Um, in, uh, in Germany and in France, uh, if uh, uh, there, uh, there are no subsidies in the future, then the profitability is not guaranteed. Uh, we have subsidies that arise from uh, 33 euros per megawatt hour to 66, depending on the case scenario, but they can be as high as 70 euros per megawatt hour. Recalling that the prices that we had in the past were between 40 and 44, uh, it means a lot. Uh, and the, the premium that is used in Germany can go up to 102 uh, euros for offshore wind. Um, so again, uh, the additional capacity will have to be subsidized. And if we aggregate over the uh, capacity that we consider in the next 30 years, uh, so you can read the, uh, the figures, the, I mean, it is very high. Um, depending on the country, uh, uh, still the level of the uh, public intervention uh, is uh, considerable. Nevertheless, what we say is considerable, but still small uh, compared to the efforts that we have to make in order to uh, uh, I mean, uh, make the energy transition and the decarbonization, and even further now, the net zero a reality. That is everything that I wanted to, to tell you, at least uh, before answering your question, if I'm able to do so with my angle of an economist. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Anna. So just to remind people, if they want to uh, ask a question, they can just uh, type it to me in the chat and then I can invite you to unmute. Uh, you may have seen my message already. But just to start us off, um, I, I was going to ask a, a couple of questions myself. Um, towards the end of your talk, you, you, you mentioned about doing some sensitivity tests to the reanalysis, for example, moving trends. And so I was wondering if I could follow up on that in terms of the uncertainty from the modeling. Uh, in terms of where you think the greatest uncertainty lies? Is it in the kind of the driving climate data or is it in the economics models? In particular, 
I mean, linked to that, I was, I, there was a Guardian article uh, just a, a couple of days ago where they were mentioning that in the year 2000, the, Interna the International Energy Agency, they said, made a prediction in the year 2000 that in 20 t years time, by 2020, there would be a grand total of 18 gigawatts of solar energy. And, and already by 2007, we were installing more than that in one year. So it, it seems that they massively, massively underestimated uh, the growth of renewables. Presumably, they didn't see the increases in feed-in tariffs and so on. So I was just wondering if you could perhaps tell us a little bit more about the uncertainties of the level of the modeling and perhaps what's changed in these 20 years that gives us more confidence mm. in these projections now compared to 20 years ago. Um, very rich questions. So um, I'm trying to answer with, uh, with um, my own vision also of the uh, of the energy transition and what I have learned and also including uh, the uh, climatic variability in what I was used to think as the future of renewables on the economic side. Um, um, the, the, the variability is the key question and uh, disentangling the, the economic uh, variability or uncertainty from the climatic one um is what we attempted to make even if at the end of the day we have uh, um somehow um proposed a different way to uh, take all these sources of variability on the economic variability we had uh, explicitly the uh, integrated assessment models and the different scenarios for the um uh, penetration of renewables uh, in particular for wind, taking everything else as constant, uh, and the uh, level of the demand. Uh, so we have the low, medium, and high electrification. Um, for the variability due, due to climate, you are right, we have played with the uh, different sensitivities of the reanalysis. Therefore, we have an impact which is indirect. So which affects, I would say, the entire time series. Instead, when we have the different scenario, it's like truncating the source of economic variability. Um, this was also useful for us in order to, uh, to focus uh, somehow on different uh, evolution of the energy sector. Uh, then, if you ask me how much does, do I trust to the price series of electricity that we build, uh, I have to say that it is an exercise uh, and that uh, I, I have worked a lot on electricity markets, and uh, uh, I'm used to say I do not work to, to I do not want to, to to work on it longer because they somehow they are unpredictable. Um, so uh, uh, on the simulations that we do, uh, and uh, having understood how it works from the climate side and how it works or not on the mm -hmm. on the uh, economic side i would say that the heavier assumptions that we make is the on the economic side okay um regarding the fact that uh, the reality is always different and then there is a momentum still a momentum for these uh, uh investments well, I think that uh, the something that we do not consider uh, here that that is the decrease in the cost uh, of the uh, of the uh, really on the technological uh, side is, is very interesting, uh, and uh, this learning effect that is the reduction of the cost every time that we double the capacity uh, is still uh, extremely high. Uh, and uh, to me, this is the most important driver today for that explains why people invest. And the other is the anticipation the, uh, of what it is going to be the future of the uh, energy industry. Okay. Uh, I've got a question on the chat. They've asked me to actually just read it out to you. They were just asking, you talked about using a stochastic model to downscale the daily data to hourly data in time, but they were mentioning that when it comes to you know the reanalysis, the or even the cordex, uh, it misses a lot of the complexity of the topography, and that wind farms tend to be on hilltops, where the the wind speed might be a lot higher than it would be uh, as a kind of grid box average in the climate data. They were wondering if you accounted for that, the fact that the you know you might actually be under optimistic if you weren't accounting for the fact that the individual location within a kind of a grid cell yeah, yeah, yeah. might be much more beneficial. Yeah, this was a huge problem, uh, how to fill 
uh, the, 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 those gaps. Um, so the, 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 the choice that we have made is to, um, um, to fill those gaps by performing different simulations uh, and to, uh, to avoid being over optimistic or under optimistic. Uh, we ran at Monte Carlo simulations and we took the uh, somehow uh, average values. Uh, uh, of course, they, we are integrating some, uh, some, well, given that those, those gaps are filled by simulations, um, there, there, there is uh, an impact uh, on that. Uh, but I would say that at the time scale that we consider, and given also the, uh, the, uh, on, the, on the other side, the need to keep precision on the, uh, uh, on the price data, that was like uh, a trade-off that we wanted to solve in this way. Okay, I've got there's one other as well, which again I've been asked to read out. Uh, and I think this is the last question I've got. If anybody else wants to send one, they still have time to send a quick one. They were just asking about the feed-in tariffs, uh, and they were saying, do feed-in tariffs ever distort the market to such extent that generation of a certain type is installed where really it's never going to be economical? without fit. In other words, does it, can it cause market distortions in terms of choices? And they're also asking that when, when, when feeding tariffs are, are designed, do they account for the fact no. that they can actually, uh, can, they, can they, for example, does account for the fact that in the future, you might actually get a, a payback because of the fact that prices come down in time through increased capacity. So windmills, solar panels, and so on, the more you produce, the lower the price becomes. And therefore, it might actually become cheaper, and therefore, in the future, uh, cheaper than coal or other sources. And you'll actually get a payback over time due to the fact that you're producing a, should we say, a cheaper form of generation in the future, even if you have to invest in it with subsidies in the present time. Yeah. So the the uh, so again, a lot of question in in once. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, at once. Um, so feeding tariffs. Um, they uh, are not locational specific, uh, even though for economic efficiency they should be, mm. but it is impossible since they are public su subsidies, they cannot be contingent to something that varies within a country. So this mm. is a problem, a legal problem, I would say. But in terms of economic efficiency, they should be um, uh, uh, linked to the, um, for instance, the, the variability of the wind, mm -hmm. uh, which is territorial. So forget about making such a difference. The second point is how do they vary in time and how there is a feedback also on the cost. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the way in which they are set is that uh, in, at the beginning, they were really fixed over a long period. When I say at the beginning, I, I'm for the countries that we consider, they have started more or less at the beginning of the um, 20th century. So around to 2008, uh, what, 21, 21st century, 2008, 2009, um, due to the introduction of the uh, uh, renewable directive. Um, so the first contract were really granting a fixed um, price to right. uh, renewables. Then they have started, since they are very costly, they are, the, the, this was uh, creating like uh, more or less a bubble, especially mm -hmm. in photovoltaics, less in, in wind. And then they have been modified. So actually in the countries where they still exist, uh, they, uh, the, the amount of the feeding tariff decreases as long as the capacity is deployed. Okay. So in, indirectly, they take into account the uh, cost effect. Okay, okay. And the Brilliant. third point is that is why feeding are progressively being abandoned um, and the premia are being introduced because they are not administrative subsidies, but they do depend on the uh, electricity price. So yeah. if the electricity price is l relatively low, so it depends on each country as its own level, uh, then there is a top up. Uh, if it is high, then they are remunerated as the other uh, conventional thermal uh, production means. Okay. So yeah. the distortion, if there is one, was especially at the beginning, 
mm -hmm. uh, when there was the, 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 the initial investment in renewables. Okay. And if this distortion has led to uh, installed capacity, well, I think that there are distortions that are much heavier uh, in the energy system. Okay. Kind of like the subsidy to fossil fuels. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so thank you very much.